Good evening, and welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. Hope that the week has been going well for you, and we're glad that we can be together. Let me share a couple announcements with the congregation before we get into our Bible study. We have several that we want to continue to be remembering in our prayers. They include those who are on the shut-ins list, Danny Dunn, Lois Smith, Barb Murphy, Ruth Scott, John Slane, Deb Karamaza, and Blaney Backus. And then there are several others who are dealing with illnesses and who have gone through some surgeries and are recovering. Please keep them in your prayers as well. Donna Morris is at home following a fall and she is recovering from her injuries and doing fairly well. Also, please keep in your prayers uh, Sister Sue Drake as she is dealing with some health issues and uh, Brother Roger Dye had surgery yesterday and uh, came through that surgery very well, gallbladder surgery, and is back home now and is doing well at home and he'll be recovering there. So we're thankful for the good news that we have to report, but please keep all these and their families in your prayers and remember them with cards and let them know that you're thinking of them and I know that you will because you do an excellent job of, of that kind of work. One announcement for the congregation, especially for our teachers, and that is this coming Sunday, after morning services, there will be a meeting to discuss the possibility of restarting children's Bible classes. We'll announce that again, of course, Sunday morning, but teachers, if you would plan to stay just a little bit after services on Sunday morning for that meeting, and Hopefully that's something that we can get going before too long here and uh, get those classes started for our young ones. All right, let's take a moment for a word of prayer and then we'll get into our study for this evening. Our precious Father in heaven, thank you so much for allowing us to have this opportunity to come together and be able to open your word, to read and to study and encourage each other. Father, we pray that you will help us to grow in our understanding. We pray that we will always have a desire to want to know your will and even more to do your will and to share it with others. Help us, Father, as we strive to live for you. We ask your blessings upon the church, the church throughout the world as we try to share the gospel with others. And the congregation here, we pray that you'll be with us Bless our elders and our deacons and help all of us, Father. We pray that we can be a light to our community and we pray that you will bless the efforts that we are able to support, the good works that we're involved in. Father, we know that there are several of our number who are ill, who are dealing with things that they may have to deal with the remainder of their days here upon this earth. We pray that you'll be with them Strengthen them and bless them. Give them courage. Give them patience. Give them endurance. Father, if it's possible, we pray that those who are ill can recover a portion of their health. And we're so thankful for the good news of those who have had surgeries or injuries and are recovering. We pray that you will be with our sister Donna and that you'll bless bro Brother Roger, help them, and please be with Sister Drake and help her with the difficulty she's going through. Father, we ask that you will help our country. There is so much unrest, so much bitterness. We pray, Father, that you will help things to improve, that people will look to you for the guidance that they need, and that righteousness can abound. And Father, we pray you'll be with our leaders and that you'll help them to make decisions that are in accord with your will. Heavenly Father, we also pray about the health issues that we're facing, especially this COVID-19 crisis. We pray that you will keep us safe, that you will help those who are dealing with this matter, give them wisdom and skill. And we pray that the day will be very soon when we will not have to worry about this illness any longer. We pray, Father, that you'll be with us now as we open your word and study together. 
And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I would encourage you this evening to open your Bibles to the book of Colossians, to chapter 2, as we want to continue in our study of this great letter. Colossians chapter 2, and we're ready to start at verse 1. Remember that the Apostle Paul is the author. It's written, of course, to the church there in Colossae. And Colossae was in an area where we would call today a tri-city area. It was Laodicea, Hierapolis, and Colossae. And so they were very close to one another, connected to one another. And in fact, all of them are mentioned in, in this letter. And you see that Paul is concerned about the church in that area. He wants them to know that he is thankful for them, that he is praying for them. He wants them to hold on to the hope of heaven that we have in the gospel. He tells them that he is praying that they might be strengthened, that they might walk worthy of the Lord, keep living the Christian life. He reminds them that they've been redeemed, forgiven by the blood of Christ. And then he reminds them about the preeminence of Christ. And that word preeminence just means first place. Christ is to have first place in all things. And he shared with them in the beginning of this letter how Christ has first place over creation. He has always been and always will be, and he is the one who created all things and sustains all things by the power of his word. And he has first place in the church. And he makes it very clear that the church is his body. The body is the church, and he is the head of the the church. And then he reminds them of the work that he is involved in, and that is that he might present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Remember, the theme of this letter is the idea that we are complete in Christ. In him, we have everything that we need, and we can be all that God intends for us to be when we are in Christ. So with that in mind, let's look in chapter 2. Now remember, when you come to a letter like this, remember that Paul's not the one who put these chapters in here. Men did that later to help us to be able to find passages. And so a lot of times these chapter divisions are kind of arbitrary. What Paul did was write one letter, not four chapters. And so sometimes when you have these divisions, it's like, oh, we're going to pick up with another subject. Well, not really. Paul's continuing with that same thought. He wanted to be able to present all men perfect in Christ Jesus. And he was thankful for the work that he was able to do in the name of Christ and the work that Christ was able to do through him. So with that in mind, you look at verse 1 of chapter 2. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Evidently there were many who had not met Paul personally that he was writing this letter unto. We don't know if he had ever been to Colossae or not. Perhaps many of them had met him in coming to Ephesus or other places where he had labored. But many he did not know by face. He hadn't met them, and yet you see the great concern that he has for them. He says, I want you to know what great conflict, what great striving I have for you. One of the big thoughts I want us to get tonight as we look in Colossians chapter 2 is just right here in, in these first few verses. And it's the idea of caring for the church. I don't think we can over, overstate how important it is for us to care for the church of our Lord. The Apostle Paul, in almost every letter that he writes, if not every letter, 
you see him expressing that. Whether he's concerned that they're being led astray or he's concerned about them continuing to grow or the works that they're involved in or opportunities that are going to be given to them, struggles that they face, persecution that they're going to go through, it just comes through how much he cares for the church of Christ. And I hope that we'll follow that example and that we will have this kind of concern and care for the Lord's church. You think, well, what, what would that lead to if we care for the church, love the church, strive for the church the way that the Apostle Paul did? Well, certainly it would lead us to be praying for the church, wouldn't it? And Paul does that here. In this letter, he expresses it a few times that he is praying for them. And I hope that we are people who pray for the church. I, um, I think it's important for us to, to be praying for one another. Pray for our elders. Use their names. Pray for our deacons. Can you name them all? Pray for their families, our Bible class teachers, our senior members, our parents, our families, our children. Pray for all. Pray for all. You know, we just mentioned in our announcement several that are ill. And it's easy sometimes because we do this on a regular basis. Just kind of to gloss over that kind of list. I mean, this is called a, a prayer list. And we want to pray for these people. Pray for them as individuals and for their families. <laughs> I, I, I know sometimes that's hard to do, and, and maybe, like I said, we, we get callous to it. We just get used to things, and we, we just pray. Maybe we pray for all those that are on the sick list. I remember a congregation or hearing of a congregation where they wanted to change that, and so what they did, instead of listing them in the bulletin, they did that, but they had a whiteboard up front. And they listed all the names of the people that they wanted to be praying for. Well, the brother that got up to pray that time led the prayer, and they wanted him to pray for them individually. His prayer was, Lord, be with all the people listed on the board. Well, that's about the same as those listed. In, and nothing wrong with that. Sometimes I, I know the list might be too long in a public prayer to be able to do that. And invariably, when you do it, you feel like, I, I don't want to miss anyone. But so often you do because we're human and, and maybe we just, you know, skipped a line or someone got let. And we don't want that to happen. We don't want anyone to feel slighted or that we're not praying for them. So maybe it's not always possible to do that kind of thing. But as individuals, certainly we can. And let people know that we're praying because we care for the church. I think it's going to make us more active members, isn't it? What can I do? Because I care for the church. I wonder how many elders have ever had members come up to them and say, Brother, I'm ready to work. What do you want me to do? I wonder how often that's happened. I, I, I don't know. Maybe it has. Maybe it happens often to elders. But I, I, I'm kind of thinking that if you did that, you might have to wait a moment for them to catch their breath or maybe help them back up after they pass out or something like that. Because that doesn't happen very often, it doesn't seem like. But we would be better workers. No one would have to worry about us as far as attendance goes because we'd be here every time possible. We'd never forsake the assembling of the saints together. And we'd be inviting others to come and be with us because our greatest concern is the work of the church and that work is trying to win souls for Christ. We'd be better givers. I, I like the way that those Macedonians gave. They gave of themselves first, the Bible says. And when you do that, giving's never going to be a problem. And... You just think about the devotion that we would have to, to Christ because glory is to be given to Him 
in the church. And Paul had this great, great concern for the church. And I hope that we do too. And we, I hope that that concern, it just continues to grow. Just continues to grow. Because we want the church, church to succeed more than anything else. More than anything else. So here he reminds them of this great conflict, the great striving, the great concern that he has for them. And for those in those other cities of, of Laodicea and at Hierapolis, that, those tri-cities. Verse 2, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. Here, here again, his, his desire, his prayer for them. I like the phrase there, knit together in love. What is it that holds us together? It's that idea of love. Love for our God, for our Lord, that leads us to love one another, even leads us to love our enemies. And that, that's contagious. It's the kind of love that will show the world that we belong to Christ. And they were knit together in love for one another. And they had in Christ this full assurance. Riches, or unto all riches of the full assurance of, of understanding. I don't know about you, but that just makes me think of the assurance that we have of our salvation in Christ. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13 John is going to write and say, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye might know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. I like it in a letter when the author says, Here's why I wrote this. And here he does that. He does it a couple times in 1 John. So there were a few reasons, but he says, I'm writing so that you can know you have eternal life. And when we're in Christ, that's the full assurance that we can have. And he wanted these brethren to know that. We've talked about the mystery already that the Gentiles and the Jews are going to be one in Christ. In Christ and Christ in them. The riches of Christ in them. This is that mystery. And then you look in verse 3, and he says, In whom, that is in Christ, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All spiritual wisdom, all spiritual knowledge is found in Christ. You're not going to find it anyplace else. One of the things that was bothering the brethren at Colossae was this doctrine of mysticism. This idea that somehow, some way, you can gain more knowledge than what we have in Christ. You can get closer to deity in some other way. Now that's not true, but there are those even today who profess to have that kind of knowledge. And Paul wants them to know that all these treasures, all heavenly wisdom, all spiritual knowledge is found in one place, in Christ. Remember, he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He, he's the one that came to reveal that to us, that truth that can set us free. He is that truth. And so... All we need is found in Christ, complete in Him. Jesus is the answer to every spiritual endeavor. Um, one person wrote that the ultimate wisdom for mankind is not another formula, another gadget, or a new discovery. It is in Christ. I like that. It's interesting, isn't it, when you think about the wisdom that men have developed. We like to think of ourselves as being pretty wise. 
And we have come up with some pretty neat gadgets and a lot of neat discoveries and that kind of thing. But what happens every time something is discovered? It just opens up more doors for other things that need to be discovered. Another hallway with all these other doors that need to be looked into. And, and so you, you never get to the point where, oh, we got it all. Nope, we're still searching because we just don't know. And every time we find something out, it seems like just find out how much we don't know. Well, that's not the case with Christ. He has revealed to us all that we need to know. All spiritual wisdom and knowledge is found in him. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. The idea of beguile here is the idea of to reason into error. Someone trying to use reason to lead people away from Christ. And they do it through their enticing words. Words can be very persuasive. And people who, who have some ability as orators, as speakers... They, they can get people to do things that they weren't planning on doing. Does that ever happen to you? You ever listen to someone and you do something, you, you weren't planning to do that at all that day? You know, I, in fact, we, we get calls all the time. You know, are, we're selling this, we're selling that. You weren't thinking about those kinds of things. If you were, you would have called them. But they call you and... You know, if someone has got a good spiel that they go through, make it sound really good. Do you remember that fella? I don't even know his name, but he had this infomercial for those sham wows. Anybody buy one of those? You know, he, he made them look so good. And, oh, man, he could talk up a storm. And it just, you know, it just flowed. And he had this whole thing. And, I mean, I was at the fair last year. And right kind of catty corner to the fair was this fella who was selling these little toys. They were sold back in the 70s, I think. And they were like a little worm, and he could make that thing do everything. You couldn't see the little string that was attached to it. It just made it look like that was a little creature. And why, he had people buying those by the handful because he could put on such a good show. And with those enticing words, well... That happens spiritually, sadly. You hear somebody preach or say that they're preaching, and people will say, oh, that was a good lesson. Well, what did he say? I don't know, but it's good. Well, it just sounded good to us. He was a good speaker. Well, there can be a lot of good speakers. But what are they really saying? And Paul wanted them to be careful. You, you think about... You know, in that day, how some people would just pride themselves on their ability to speak, to address a group. They were just known for that. When Paul was on trial, the Jews went and got someone that they knew was a great speaker so that he could present their case. And why, if you can't win with your arguments, maybe you can with just the way you present it. Doesn't that happen in our politics quite often? We don't pay much attention to what the issues are, what they believe on the... How do he say it? How did he come across? Was he stiff? Was he robotic? Or was he charismatic? You hear that word, don't you? you know, he just has the it factor. And, and, and so people follow them. Well, Paul doesn't want them to be led astray led into error by people who may have that kind of ability, make things sound good. And if people aren't grounded in the truth, then when someone makes error sound pretty good, there are a lot of people that are really ready to swallow that. And so we've got to be careful. And Paul is letting them know that I'm concerned about you. I, I don't want that to happen 
unto you. He says in verse 5, For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the Spirit, join and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. He commends them for these things and he's really encouraging them to continue in that same way. Continue in the order that you've been following. What you have been given in Christ. What's been delivered unto you. You hold to that. Don't go away from it. And you be steadfast in your allegiance unto Christ and his teaching. Verse 6, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. You keep living the way that you've been taught to live. You keep practicing the things that we have taught you or Epiphras that was with you, that he taught you because I taught him. And you keep holding to the doctrine of Christ and you walk in him. What you've received is enough to make you just what God wants you to be, perfect in Christ. And folks, you can't get better than that. There was the temptation for them to think, well, maybe we need something a little bit more. And you think about how often people fall for that today. I really believe that New Testament Christianity as it's presented in the, in the gospel is relatively simple. I mean, you think about our worship services. There's not a lot of ceremony involved in that, is there? We sing. Everybody sings. Do you have to have any kind of special training? No. No, you don't. A lot of us don't. I mean, a lot of us do. A lot of you can read music. You can sing soprano and alto and, and, and bass and tenor, and it sounds beautiful. I just sing also, and a lot of people do. And that's okay when we sing from the heart. No, don't have to have a special group doing the singing for us. No, we all sing. We pray. Don't have to have prayers memorized. That's not what the Lord wants. And we have our communion service. All it involves is unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. Some of the most common items that our world knows, found throughout the world. Preaching and teaching and an opportunity to give to the Lord. No special garments have to be worn by individuals. We just want to be modest. We want to honor our God, show respect and reverence unto him. But no special headwear or no one has to have some kind of special degree to, to lead us in this. And, and we don't have to have a lot of, you know, a fancy building. We go down to Costa Rica, you're sitting on an old wooden bench. The sun's beating down on you on a tin roof. Can you worship that way? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so it's not complicated. But I think a lot of people think, well, that, that's too simple. You mean all I need to do is I need to believe that Christ is the Son of God. I, I know I need to repent of my sins and confess Him and then, then be immersed in water, baptized to have my sins washed away, that, that's it. I don't have to climb Mount Everest. I don't have to swim the ocean. I don't have to go kill 10 lions or what. No, no. But people think that there's got to be more to it. So we got to put more in there. And at Colossae, evidently, they were thinking that way. But when you have Christ, when you're in Christ, when you walk in Him, you can't do any better than that. I was thinking about this this afternoon, and I kept thinking, I don't know if this is a good illustration or not, but I think about, I take a vitamin every day. And, you know, on the side of that, it, it has the listing of, of 
the recommended daily allowance and that kind of thing. And most of the things that are in that vitamin pill, it's 100% of all that you need just in that little pill. Now, I don't know how good that is for me or not. Some people say you don't need to take a vitamin like that. I, I don't know. You get a lot from your food and that kind of thing. But anyway, I, I do. Well, if one is good, if it provides 100% of what, why don't I take four or five? Wouldn't that be better? I mean, I'll get 500%, right? No. You still just get 100. Your body will just get rid of everything else. And with Christ, he, you, can have, you have 100% of all that God wants us to have when we're in Him. You don't need anything else. And that's what Paul is trying to get across to them. So you walk in God. Christ as you have received him. Verse 7, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. The Christian religion is a taught religion. They were to continue growing, continue walking in Christ, continue serving him according to what they'd been taught. But they needed to continue to mature, be rooted. You don't see roots, do you? you go down into the ground. I, I asked Google today, what tree has the deepest roots? And Google responded by saying that the wild fig tree has been reported to have roots that are over 400 feet deep. That needs to be us. We're, we're going to be as rooted in Christ as deep as we can. Those roots give such strength. I, I remember several years ago when we lived in Parkersburg, we had a house, and at the back of the house there was an alley, and I wanted to put a little driveway there, or a place to park my car. I was going to put gravel there and park my car out back because the street out front was narrow. And, and so I, I thought, I'll, I'll put that in. But they had bushes there. I thought, okay, how am I going to get these bushes out? I, I know. I'll tie a rope to them, and I'll tie the other end of my bumper, and I'll pull those things out. I couldn't get them out. Now, it was just a 75 Plymouth value. They don't have a lot of power. But I thought, I'm going to pull the bumper off of this. Things aren't moving. The only way I got them out is by digging them out because of the roots. And they weren't 400 feet deep. But they weren't going to move because they were rooted. Well, that's what Paul is saying that he wanted, he desired for these Christians, that they be rooted and, and built up in him, in Christ established in the faith and you, you hold on to what you've been taught as you have been taught and then you abound in thanksgiving you think we could ever give God enough thanks for what he's done for us could we ever thank Christ enough for what he's done for us I want to encourage you to do something from time to time if you're not already. I, I want to encourage you from time to time in your prayers not to ask God for anything, just to say a prayer to say thank you. Just to say thank you. We owe him everything. And we could never give enough thanks unto our God. So he says, I want you to be rooted, built up, established in the faith as you've been taught, but you abound in thanksgiving. All right, we're going to stop right there. And Lord willing, next time we'll pick up and continue in our study here in the book of Colossians. I really appreciate everyone's good attention. And I hope that, that you're getting a lot out of these studies. And uh, I know it would be better if we could all be here in person, but uh, I appreciate you listening paying attention the way that you are. 
appreciate the good comments that you give me from time to time and and we'll continue lord willing next week in this good study remember that Paul is trying to remind them that in Christ we have everything that we need. And I just want you to know that if you're not yet in Christ, you need to take that step. And the only way into Christ is by being baptized into him. So if that's your desire, please let us know. We'll help you at any hour of the day. And if you are one who has obeyed, but maybe you've fallen away and need to come back, we want to pray with you and for you. Let's close our study tonight with a word of prayer. Our precious Father in heaven, thank you for allowing us to study from your word tonight. We pray that you will help us to always be thankful and that we will remember that in Christ we are everything that you would want us to be. Thank you for the blessings that we have in him. And Father, we pray that we might always strive to be rooted and built up and established as we've been taught. Thank you, Lord, for the church. We pray your greatest blessings upon her. And help us, Lord, to always be about your work. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.